If I put microphone, that's going to work, right? Okay. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, today we were, we're going to start talking about uh, real problems. Uh, so far, we have seen the fundamentals of mechanics, and those are related to one, elasticity, and second, failure, uh, rock failure. And today, we'll start seeing uh, how we apply those, and especially uh, as it is related to rock failure and rock failure at the large scale. So, let me move this. No. <coughs> okay. Um, so, do you guys know what faults are? Any anyone knows what a fault is? Cracks in tectonic plates. Uh, say again, Amar. Cracks in tectonic plates. Um, yeah, you're getting close, but but now we need to get a little more specific. Uh, what kind of uh, cracks? So so by now we know that the rocks can break uh, several ways, and you can get fractures either when you have tensile stresses, or you can have also fractures when you have shear stresses. So now it's becoming very important that we know the difference between those two. And faults are going to be uh, an example of shear fractures. Let's see how, how this works. Um, imagine that, that you are in a place where there is, well, let me start with no mountains. There is a sedimentary basin, and there are layers of rock, and as we have seen before, uh, you can have the effect of tectonic plates that push this uh, sedimentary basin, and if you push too much, you're going to break it, or tectonic plates are going to break this. So uh, let's imagine that, uh, for example, at this point, uh, we had, it was a long time ago, so I'm gonna make here a schematic of a, a dinosaur, okay? so. It's a long time ago, but if, if you have tectonic plates and those uh, act over millions uh, of years, uh, this is going to change. And it might change so that, for example, you cre can create mountains and next to these mountains, you can create also fractures. And let me try to make sense out of this. This is gonna be like this. And let me make it a little bit more realistic. If you have large stresses pushing from the sides, again, because of the tectonic plates, uh, you're going to get to break the, the earth crust. Okay, so let me finish this plot, this drawing, and I'll make a point about how it failed. Um, so, what? why did I draw this this way. Do, do you have any idea why this one went over this part of the of the rock? 
question? Yes. Does it have to do with the stress regime? He has to, he has to, yeah, it's related to the stress regime. Yes, these are convergent plates, so they are pushing this way. Yes. So let's go one, one step further. Uh, but, but you got the first point right. So it's about the stresses, because stress are pushing in this direction. And because they are pushing in this direction, this part is going to go up, and this one is going to go down. It's the same with the mountains, OK? Uh, but very likely, if you have millions of years pass by, also, you're going to have some erosion in here. And probably after a long time, you will have a river over there. So you, you won't see this part that was there before. But it was there. But it was eroded away. The part, well, first of all, this is going to be a fault. And it's a shear fracture. And whatever is below the fault is called the foot wall and whatever is above the fault is called the hanging wall that's a typical convention uh, in structural geology so um, let me finish my art over here and then we'll talk about the mechanics so there is a river over there um, probably here we can have now it was a long time ago after a long time ago we have now a cow okay so um faults are just shear fractures and the orientation of faults is going to be dictated by the state of a stress i i hope that by now you can see that this fault formed in this way and this section went up and this one relative to the other went down because we have a state of stress which is if I were to make this simpler it's like this the maximum stress is in this direction where is the minimum stress let, let's imagine uh, there is one piece of uh, information missing here. Let's say this fault is like this, perpendicular to the to the plane. Where should sigma three be? From the side or from the top? If this one is a fault, that it's like that. We're going to see the reasons why in the top, okay? Uh, in a little bit. Uh, but it's going to be in the top. And this one is going to be sigma 2. Whenever I have this combination, solids, uh, frictional materials like rocks, are going to break, as we have seen in the laboratory, with a plane, uh, which is quite a steep relative to the direction of sigma 1 and notice that also now we're going to three dimensions but remember what you did in the laboratory and that's why the laboratory to me is very important because you did it on your own and you got to see that how rocks break and what you were doing in the laboratory was to fail the rocks loading them in direction uh, parallel to the axis and they always they broke like this with a plane at an angle from the axial stress and this is exactly the same so a fault is going to be a shear fracture but sometimes when you go to outcrops also you get to see some other kind of uh, cracks and sometimes you get to see especially when uh, rocks uh, get uh, exhumated so that means they were very very deep at large temperature and high stress and you take them up uh, temperature goes down and stress goes down too and they develop cracks but 
these are not shear cracks. So usually these type of cracks, these are called joints. And the difference between a joint and a fault is that while in a fault there is a relative displacement in the direction of the fault, for example, let me zoom over here, these two dots, several billions years ago, they were together, but now they have moved relative to each other along the fault. These two are still facing each other. This is what is called an open mode fracture in which the relative displacement of the, these two points is in the plane or in direction perpendicular to the fracture and this is a shear fracture because there is a relative displacement on the plane of the fracture. So that's what makes them different. Sometimes if you go to the field, if you go to do some hiking around Greenbelt, uh, you're gonna see uh, joints and faults and shear fractures. It's important that you recognize the difference between those two. Usually in the subsurface, there are not as many joints as you see on surface because uh, those rocks uh, haven't been exposed to this exhumation process. All right, um, any question so far? No? I have a yes. Okay, so you said that the minimal horizontal stress signal is three is on the top, right? The minimum, yes. Okay, so that's an example like perpendicular at an angle, right? Like it's kind of off to the side, like the fracture. Like, you know, like if sigma three is vertical, right? And yeah. Uh, it is, uh, no, it is perpendicular. In this case, this is the vertical stress. And it is perpendicular to this one, perpendicular to that one. It's not, this fracture is not perpendicular to sigma three. That's what you mean? No, no, it's not. And it should not be, okay? It's at an angle of sigma one, at an angle of sigma three. W one more thing related to that. Uh, so. It's just for this type of open mode fractures or hydraulic fractures where the fracture is perpendicular to sigma three. For shear fracture, it is not. It is always at an angle. Um, okay, so, yeah. Uh, so are joints caused just by the depressurization? Yes, so one is the effect of the stress as it goes up the stress go down, but it's also temperature. As rocks cool down and go to the surface, they start to shrink, and when they shrink, they break. Okay, so let me share with you here some uh, pictures about faults. Oh, no, 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 uh, we're already in five, so Okay, that's uh, another T-Rex over here. Uh, these are examples of faults and what we have been uh, mentioning, right? In which you have a major discontinuity and there is a relative displacement of one side uh, respect to the, to the other. Faults uh, are very important in geomechanics because as we're going to see, once they constitute uh, traps for oil and gas. It depends what about what you have here inside the fracture, but they are very good traps for, for oil and gas. Uh, second, they control the state of stress. And third, we're going to see that if we increase too much the pressure, we can also reactivate faults and induce seismicity uh, with some of our uh, petroleum operations. So you have to be uh, you have to understand and be careful about the equilibrium of these faults. Uh, here you have another example of a fault, and there are uh, two ways in which you can map these faults in the field. Well, there are several ways, but I just like to mention two. 
Um, anyone knows about an example of how to map uh, faults in the field? So if I go to the field, Um, wait, I didn't want to do that. So, let me check it's still working. Okay, it is. Okay, let, let me allow you to think a little bit more. And I'll show you an example about faults. You guys like creme brulee? Uh, what what is creme brulee? <laughs> it, it's a French dessert, right? But it's it's very similar to the earth crust because let's see where do I find a good picture about? They are all good, you think? <laughs> Okay, I like this one. So, so this, this is what we have in uh, in the subsurface too. So, the the crust of the Earth, uh, we all know that that deep in the inside the Earth is all magma, right? It's very ductile. It's moving inside. There is convection. And as we go towards the surface, the rock gets uh, cooler, and there is also less uh, confining stress, and so it gets more brittle. Uh, so we come back to this issue of brittleness, right? Brittleness is very important in these cases. And uh, as we get towards the crust, if you have external forces, external stresses, you can break that brittle layer. And those... Uh, Broken parts; those are the faults in uh, in the case of the of the Earth. So it's it's very similar. Okay, so I wanted to come back over here. So how do we uh, image faults in um, in the field? Well, there there are basically uh, two major methods. Uh, I'm gonna write it down in the here in the notes, but I need some images here. I think I have one over here. Uh, what? I heard something? No. The first method is seismic. So with seismic, uh, you can detect major faults in the subsurface. <coughs> we we see faults in outcrops, but those are not re very relevant to us. Uh, some some of them they are. But uh, if we really want to know what's in the subsurface, then you need to do, need to do seismic. And with seismic, you pick up all the horizons or sedimentary uh, layers, and if there is a difference, if there is a mismatch between those horizons, that tells you that there is a fault. Uh, seismic is very good uh, on mapping these uh, large faults. But what happens if you have small faults or small fractures which are below the resolution level of seismic? Do you know any method that helps you map these fractures or these faults? Let me get over here. So the second method is, uh, is really well -born. You drill a wellbore, and as you drill the, the wellbore, you take images around the wellbore. Uh, something called wellbore imaging. I'm not sure if, if you cover that in uh, information evaluation with Professor Torres Verdi. You, you did a little bit? Okay. So what are the methods uh, to image a wellbore? There are basically two. One is with resistivity. You can image resistivity around the wellbore. And the other one is with acoustic impedance or acoustic velocity. So you send a wave and you receive it back. 
and you measure like echolocation, it's uh, the same concept, and you measure how long it takes. Either with resistivity or with ultrasonic, as in this image, you can get an image of the wellbore that looks more or less like this. That if you, uh, this is called the unwrapped image of the wellbore, so you see it goes from north, east, south, west, north again, and if you make the north and the north match into this figure on the right, you get a three-dimensional image of the wellbore, and if in your wellbore you see these sinusoids in there, these sinusoids are really fractures. When you make this point match with that point, you get uh, with uh, the image of something like this, where the peaks, that peak, and this peak over here will be the top of the fracture, and the troughs here and somewhere over there will be the bottom. And according to the orientation of this fracture, respect to the, the north and the, the east and the south and west, and according to the orientation of the wellbore, you can get to know what is the orientation of the fracture. In this example, uh, how many fractures do you see? Well, you have two arrows there telling you clearly that there are two, right? But let me ask you something more. Uh, where is, at which orientation is the top of the fracture? More or less toward the east, right? So if you had to reconstruct this uh, fracture, uh, the north, the north is over there, right? The south is over, over there. This is a fracture which is more or less like that. In, the, in that well board. It's dipping towards, no, wait, wait, wait. The top is on the east, and the bottom is on the west, deep, it's dipping towards the west. It's like this. So, if you get that information, also you can uh, get to map uh, what is the orientation of the fracture. Okay, so let me come back over here. So let me just write that down. Okay, so we said we have seismic, and we also have wellboard imaging, and there are, there are some other methods, but we are not going to to discuss uh, those right now. And remember that we said this one is for big faults and this one is for uh, big but also small faults. Okay, so bef before we go into some definitions, uh, let, let me show a little bit of motivation of why you should learn this. Uh, why do we need the faults then? Why do we want to map the faults? A any idea why we want to do that? that that's one. A, a geologist may want to map uh, faults because those may be preparation places for hydrocarbon accumulation. But let's say we already know that there is oil in some location. We want to map these faults because we want to create 3D models of reservoirs that include that they include faults. And because we're going to see that these are very important for the reservoir geomechanics. Uh, as I was telling before, they limit the state of stress, but they also can be reactivated. Sometimes if you alter the state of stress in a fault, what was before a trap for hydrocarbon, it may start leaking. And uh, let me see if I have some luck here, if I remember that video. If I remember correctly, this was 
Okay. So sometimes if you reactivate a fault, uh, you may get into a point that your fault may start leaking. And where is that one? So you see, that's a fault on the seafloor that because uh, what I'm not sure there was already leaking or not, but probably not. Uh, after some, uh, probably injection in there, it started uh, leaking. So you can see clearly, let's come back to here. This is the plane of the fault, and there you have the oil seeping through. And in order to avoid that, what you want to do is you want to make uh, some geomechanical models like not like that one, like this one, uh, that take into account that. So where now you can see clearly the faults and probably your reservoir layers, your cap row, and you can integrate all of that in there. Uh, okay, so but before we get into that, we need to understand the basics of fault uh, characterization. Okay, so we're going to define a few things now. And uh, since we're getting into more real problems, also uh, we need to relate those to real uh, geographical conditions, okay? So let's say that we're going to a place where the north is pointing in this direction, the east is pointing in this direction, and depth is going down. Uh, this is a right-handed coordinate system. And in there, let's say that we have a block. Of. A sedimentary basin. That has layers. Probably you may not want to finish the drawing right now. Just just wait a little bit because I'm going to cut it. OK. So. This is a block of a sedimentary basin. And if we had a fault in it. Let's say it's a plane that is cutting the block here, there, and there. I'm going to erase this now. And let's say that that's a fault. We're going to define two properties here that are going to help us map these faults and <coughs> later on calculate the stress on those faults. The first one, it's the angle between the north and the plane of the fault. Oh, now let me repeat that. It's the angle between the north and the line that results of the intersection of the fault itself. This is the fault. Intersection of the fault and a horizontal plane, which is this line over here. And that one is going to be called strike. That's a strike of the fault. So again, is the line between the north, the angle between the line of the north and the line that results of the intersection of the fault, which is this one, and a horizontal plane, which is that one. That line is going to give you the strike. And the second angle, which is going to be important here, is the dip. The dip is defined as the angle between a horizontal plane, which in this case, this one is a horizontal plane, and the plane of the maximum slope in the fault. So let me see. To me, it looks like, in this case, it's more or less that one. This angle that goes by delta is the dip. 
with this, these two angles, we can fully characterize the geometry of the of the fault. So is that dashed line horizontal? Uh, which dashed line? Uh, th this one's? Uh, oh, rear, this one? Yeah. Yes, this is a line That's that it is contained on the horizontal plane. That dashed line. So this is a horizontal line and this is the line of the maximum slope. Uh, so what is this line of the maximum slope? Uh, probably you can already uh, see what, what that, that would mean in physical terms, but consider this example that probably you're not going to forget. Let's say I drop a droplet of water here. In which direction is it going to go? Is it going to go this direction? Is it going to go that direction? No, right? It will go the direction of the maximum slope and it will go in this direction. Okay, so uh, we, we need these two quantities because uh, with those, we're going to be able to define a fault with respect to the geographical coordinate system. And that's the way also geologists, they go to the field and uh, they map the faults that we later use uh, for our calculations. All right, so these two are angles, uh, strike and dip. Let's start with the strike. There are two conventions to define strike. The first one is called the quadrant uh, convention. And in this one, we tell what is the angle from some chosen uh, coordinate direction, north, east, south, or west, and in direction to the, the other. For example, what do you think more, more or less this angle is? Mm, 45 maybe, I would say 40, okay? But 45 is pretty close. Uh, so, if we are using the, the quadrant convention, we will say that the strike is equal to from the north, 40 degrees towards the east. That's how uh, we will define uh, the the angle of strike. Uh, I, I didn't choose 45 because in this example it wouldn't work. But uh, I could also look in the direction to the east and say, well, this uh, angle is really. I like to look at it from the east towards the north. So from the east is going to be 50 degrees towards the north. It's the same, right? Exactly the same, but different numbers. And uh, it depends where you start and where you end. What is your, your comparison in these uh, two axes? So that's the first convention. And the second one is called the azimuth convention. The first one is uh, very useful in the field. And the second one is most useful for putting this into a computer and making computation and storing numbers uh, because uh, you're going to see it's just easier. So in the azimuth convention, what we do is we just tell strike as the angle between the north clockwise, and this is very important, always clockwise to the line which is the intersection of the fault and a horizontal plane to that line. And in this case, it we say it was 40 degrees. And just to make sure that we are meaning the azimuth convention and azimuth is going to go from 0 to 360, we're going to use three digits. So this one is going to be 0, 40 degrees. It's the same thing. But this one is always from the north. Th these were not always at the angle of strike. Uh, it is defined from the north, but the actual number that goes there is not necessarily uh, related to the north. And uh, 
the uh, in here the azimuth convention is always from the north clockwise so remember this is <coughs> clockwise okay and the dip is a little bit easier because the dip just goes uh, from 0 to 90 so for the dip um, it's, it's just going to be an angle from 0 to 90 degrees and for example in this case to me it looks like I don't know what let's say that in this case is equal to 45 degrees uh, and that's it that's what characterizes uh, the dip okay uh, so as, as you may see from, from this image it's not very easy to draw faults in three dimensions and when you have hundreds of faults or even more that you want to map in a given location along along a wellbore let's say that there are some faults in here some big faults but there are also some uh, small faults in this other direction and um, probably you have also some smaller faults in the other direction if you want to map all of those uh, it, it gets uh, a little bit difficult to do and to plot them in three dimensions that's why we use something which are called um, which is called stereo nets and what the stereo nets do is they help us take uh, a three-dimensional object like a fault into two dimensions we're gonna get back to these stereo nets when we talk about deviated wellbores uh, when the when we have a deviated wellbore like this one and we want to map its trajectory uh, in paper or in a simple plot uh, stereo nets are very useful okay so let's see what are stereo nets stereo nets uh, are a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object okay and they consist of mapping in a half sphere so I'm drawing here half sphere where this is the north this is the east this is the west and, and of course this is the south so, so you can see that this is a half sphere in here uh, we place our fault and let me see which is going to be the most convenient location to draw this let me try this I'm gonna show you uh, a web page later that's going to clarify this but that's the intersection of the a horizontal plane with a fault and the intersection of this horizontal plane with uh, the half sphere is going to be let me do it okay I think I've got I've got this 3d something like that you see from this line we already get the strike strike is that and from the angle between the horizontal angle and and between the horizontal plane and this plane I also get what is the dip Ca can you see this plane guys in three dimensions okay well there's one more step here we, we were saying that we were moving from 3d to 2d so in order to do that 
how many perpendicular lines uh, you can have to for a plane? A perpendicular line. Um, so I have a plane, right? A plane is defined by two lines. You have two lines, you define a plane. So in, in perpendicular direction to a plane, there's just going to be one and only one direction. And that's what we're going to do here. From the center, we're going to trace a, these plots are always quite difficult, perpendicular to that plane, it's that red line, and that red line is hitting this lower hemisphere at a particular point. And that's the point that we're going to plot. So, uh, going from 3D now into 2D, this is going to look like this. So, this is the north, this is the east, this is the west, this is the south. Uh, this was the plane that we most times we do not draw, okay, but I'm just drawing it here just to make a point about that. So this is 3D and this is uh, 2D. We get from here the strike, but also from the location of the point, which is somewhere over here, we get the dip. So do you see that if we had a horizontal plane, this dot will be in the center. If we had, so if we had a plane like this, horizontal, the dot will be in the center. If we had a plane like this, vertical, the dot will be over here. And, and that's it, that's everything about stereo nets. And let me show an example over here. You can also use this uh, on your computer. So let me see if I find it. Okay. So Okay, so here you have this lower hemisphere we were talking about, right? Look how, if I, as I move the mouse, uh, what you're seeing changing there, that line, is the intersection of the lower hemisphere with the plane of the fault. So let me add a fault somewhere here with an azimuth. What is the azimuth of this fault if I put, put it right here? The strike. What's gonna be the strike of the fault? It's going to be, uh, well, let me click. It's, in this case, it's about zero, right? And this is the plane I was mentioning, and this is the line perpendicular to the plane. And when you, when you look at that from the top, the only thing that you see is the, the dot. So why is this useful? Because many times, for example, uh, we're not going to map to map just one fault. Probably in a given wellboard, we map many faults. And you can see now that looking at, if you were to look at this in 3D, it's a mess, right? It's very difficult to look at. Uh, you have all the faults in there but it's just very difficult to look at. It's much easier to look at that in two dimensions and to hide I'm not sure if I'm hiding just the planes or also the dots. No, I think just the planes. So, um, okay, okay, well, look, look at this. Um, here I just kept the ones that are striking uh, Towards the towards the west, so it's much easier to see just that those points. 
And, and we're going to see that whenever you localize where those faults are, uh, later you can tell also whether the stress is acting on them. Okay, so I strongly recommend you play with this uh, with this uh, online tool if uh, if you want to see or uh, learn more about stereo nets. And as I told you, this is going to come back later when we talk about deviated wellbore, so it's very important to know. Okay. All right. So, uh, en enough about geometry. Now let's talk about mechanics. Do, as we were discussing the, this example over here, uh, particularly this one, are those are those faults uh, dynamic, static? Are the two sides uh, moving or not? What do you think? So, so here we're looking at the sedimentary basin, which is broken, <coughs> right? Like the creme brulee, this one is also broken. But now the question is if it's moving or not. What do you think? Is it in equilibrium? So if, if it is in equilibrium, it shouldn't be moving. Or probably if it's moving, it's moving very slowly. So th that's what's going on in here. This is not getting accelerated and going into space, right? It's, it's an equilibrium. It may be moving over a very s slow time, but we, we can assume that this is now in equilibrium. So it's not moving, it's not accelerating. And, and, but this, this is broken, right? So what, what is it holding it together? That's the question. And there is nothing holding the sedimentary basin together, it's just that everything is under compression. And because it is under compression, how much stress they resist, it depends on what the strength of the fault is. So, last thing of the day. If I, let's imagine that I have a block of a sedimentary basin. And I have here this stress and that stress. I'm going to tell you on Wednesday what's going on with this. Okay? All right. So uh, see you on Wednesday, guys. I hope to have the exams uh, graded and ready by the end of the week. Hopefully.